Just to become more educated on the topic, I've been interested in doing a study on a mobile phone lens patent. And I chose this six element lens patent to side to Largan, a supplier of smartphone lens modules to Apple, Samsung, and Huawei, among others. There's no special reason for choosing this patent except that its embodiments work very well. For sure, there are thousands of patents related to mobile phone cameras. And you know, some people own conventional cameras, some people own a telescope or binoculars, but almost everyone owns one of these. There are more than 7 billion smartphone plan subscriptions in the world today. And there probably aren't 7 billion binoculars. Most webcams and flip phone cameras have four element lenses. Smartphone cameras have five to seven lens elements, with some high-end designs having eight to nine. Every surface in the six element lens patent is aspheric, which is a design feature of all mobile phone lenses. The aspheric surfaces are essential to achieve the short track lengths without introducing unacceptable wavefront error. Behind the six lens elements, there's a flat piece of glass which naturally filters out the infrared that the CMOS sensor array is sensitive to. The aperture stop is at the front surface. It could be positioned behind the first lens to better control odd aberrations, especially distortion, and in some other embodiments in this patent, that's in fact what's done. Positioning the stop at or near the front makes the lens more telecentric by minimizing the chief ray angle at the sensor array, and this then reduces the cosine to the fourth problem in the image illumination. The first lens element is a positive lens made with lower index plastic. It has a strong effect on the total track length. Now this doesn't mean though that the optical power is concentrated there. L1 is actually the second weakest lens of the six. The second positive element is made with higher index plastic. The positive third element is made from lower index plastic. Adding some positive refracting power at the front of the lens enables a smaller telephoto ratio, which can translate into a larger F number as well as larger depth of focus, making the lens less sensitive with larger F number. The negative fourth element is made from higher index plastic, the positive fifth element from lower index plastic, and finally the negative sixth element is made from lower index plastic. Aspheric surfaces are a fundamental building block in the design of miniature mobile phone lenses. By using aspheric surfaces, high performance can be achieved with fewer elements. A shorter track length is possible and aberrations such as spherical coma, astigmatism, and distortion become manageable. Not all aberrations benefit from aspheric surfaces, and by that I mean pet's fall field curvature. Also, first order properties such as focal length are not influenced by aspheric deviations. Aspheric surfaces are difficult and expensive to manufacture, especially from glass, but using plastic enables the mass production of injection molded aspheric lenses. The mold is very expensive, but it only needs to be made once. The final lens element is almost always the most deviated from spherical shape and usually resembles the form of a seagull's wing. What you'll notice about this aspheric surface is that the curvature varies as you move out from the radial center. Usually rotational symmetry is maintained and only the radial dependence of the sag needs to be described. In this expression, C is the curvature of the base sphere, kappa is the conic constant, and the A coefficients are the even aspheric coefficients. See my video on the effects of aspheres on third order aberrations for more description of this. And speaking of aberrations, the first two elements can be thought of as splitting of a single first positive lens. These first two positive elements both produce and correct for most of the spherical aberration. Third order coma is gently canceled by there being small amounts of alternating negative and positive coma coming from each surface. The remaining lenses are highly aspheric. Now it's a lot easier to manage spherical aberration, astigmatism, and Pet's fall curvature if there's a combination of negative and positive elements. L4 and L6 help with that, but L6 especially cancels a lot of astigmatism. But there's just not enough combination of negative and positive power to cancel Pet's fall. This is a more subtle matter. The claims made that the refracting power of L5 can be adjusted in order to cancel any higher order aberration that remains unbalanced by third order aberration. But the price for doing this is a whole lot of distortion which is the most severe aberration of any of the individual surfaces, especially of L5 and L6. L5 has very large negative, or barrel, distortion, 
which is used to balance out the very large positive or pincushion distortion of L6, leaving a lens with very little distortion. Perhaps a physical way to visualize how L6 balances a large negative distortion is to simulate L6 alone using parallel incoming light at a far field. The inflection point above which the diverging lens becomes converging is clear in this ray picture. The far field light is brought closer to the optical axis on the image surface and corrects for any negative barrel distortion coming in the incoming wavefront. L3, 4, and 5 are combined for achromaticity, with L3 and L5 being positive with large Abe number and L4 being negative with low Abe number. Neither the axial nor the lateral color of these lenses cancel each other, but what is left from these elements effectively cancels the color of all the other elements, leaving a lens with very little chromatic aberration. The zeroing of chromatic aberration is handled the old-fashioned way by playing the refractive indices and Abe numbers off of each other. Aspheric surfaces have no effect on chromatic aberrations. Aspheric surfaces don't influence first order properties such as magnification and focal length. This includes chromatic aberration which is the variation of focal length with wavelengths. So what is this subtle matter with Petzval curvature? To illustrate the field curvature that we could have, I reduced the six element lens to two elements. The first element has the effective focal length of the first two elements and the second one has the effective focal length of the back four elements. This lens has a Petzval radius of minus 4.5 millimeters, which might look roughly like this. But be careful not to put stock in eyeballing the ray trace and then conclude like I just did that this is the Petzval curvature. These field dependent focal points are off the image surface due to a combination of Petzval field curvature and astigmatism. So this depiction, which is sometimes wrong, is just meant to highlight the effect. A flat field is needed in the patented design. Before going back to it though, let's see what a diverging final lens can do to a curved field. Suppose rays that are already converging enter a diverging lens. Naturally they emerge a little less converging. That is, the light is a little less bent coming out than it was going in, so the field is a little less distorted, a little flatter, but not flat enough. And how do the aspheric surfaces on that last lens help? The preceding optical system has bent the light such that a diverging lens is needed for the on-axis field to focus at the image plane. And a converging lens is needed in order for the extreme fields to focus on the image plane. But aspheric surfaces have no effect on Petzval curvature, which depends on refracting power and refractive index. However, if the lens element is thick enough, the refracting power will in fact be modified, not by the aspheric surfaces, but by the separation between the aspheric surfaces. And this does alter the field curvature, which then offers the degree of freedom needed to flatten the field. As it plays out with the design in this patent, on-axis rays arrive converging, and the negative center of the lens moves the on-axis focal point out slightly, the extreme off-axis rays arrive nearly parallel and the positive edge of the lens brings their focal point in. The result is a flattened Petzval curvature. Another consequence of the final lens being converging at the far fields is that the ray pierce height on the image plane is reduced, giving a very powerful tool to manipulate image distortion. Smartphone sensors these days they measure 4.8 by 3.6 millimeters usually. They have 4,000 by 3,000 pixels or 12 megapixels. The resulting pixel pitch or separation between pixels is 1.2 microns. As there is readout integrated circuitry taking up space on the surface as well, pixel pitch isn't exactly the width of a pixel. To keep the efficiency high, a micro lens is positioned above each pixel to focus light onto the active area. And here's an actual detector in this format, ready to take the 4x3 photos that fit nicely on your phone screen in both landscape and portrait orientation. This patent presented a lens with a 40 degree half field of view that projects the farthest field to a height of about 2.8 millimeters above the optical axis. Rotate this 3D view around so that the image plane is facing us. The blue rays are on axis and the red rays are at the 40 degree field. 
All of the rays are contained within a circle of diameter 5.6 millimeters. If one of these standard image sensors is placed at the image plane, all but the corners will be filled. I'm not sure if this is the sensor size intended for use, but at least you can see how it fits with this lens. Although I'm not quite finished describing the sensor, I need to stop and go over one of the patent embodiments. In this listing, surfaces 2 through 13 are the six plastic lens elements with these refractive indices and Abe numbers. The flat infrared filter is made from NBK7 glass, optimized with that IR filter included because it adds aberration. Each surface is aspheric with these conic constants and even order aspheric coefficients. The aperture of this lens is described by a working F number of 2.35. Why are there so many lens elements? The first smartphone cameras only had three elements. But as the required track length became smaller, more elements were needed to realize the large numerical apertures, or rather the small F numbers. This also went along with the shrinking pixel sizes. So going back to that, rapid spatial variations in the image could be aliased into slower spatial variations if the point spread function is narrower than two pixels. I sometimes see it depicted like this, which corresponds to the Nyquist frequency, but also like this. And this second way makes more sense to me because it ensures that two pixels can be fully filled with the best possible case for spot size being the diffraction limited area diameter set equal to the size of two pixels. By including the square root of two in the area diameter, we're saying let's do a diagonal. Solve for the F number at the primary D wavelength, the F number should be at least 2.36. For best optical performance, it's best to design for this F number, not for something bigger. I believe this explains the choice of F number of 2.35 that was used in this embodiment. The smaller area diameter gives an F number of 1.67. I did keep that here explicitly because it's not invalid to choose an F number that corresponds to the Nyquist frequency. It's just more difficult to achieve such fast apertures. The Nyquist frequency is the largest spatial frequency that the detector can sample without aliasing. And between half Nyquist and Nyquist, the received power on a pixel depends on the degree of overlap between the spot and the pixel. So we need good optical modulation transfer only up to about half a Nyquist. We're primarily concerned that the diffraction cutoff frequency isn't higher than the detector cutoff. The sync nature of the detector MTF will permit higher spatial frequencies above the sensor cutoff to alias as lower frequencies. So there's no benefit to diffraction cutoff being as large as the sensor cutoff. But even allowing it to be that high would require a needlessly small F number, which is difficult to design and difficult to tolerance. On the other hand, a larger F number will reduce the diffraction cutoff and thus degrade the diffraction limited resolution. A second thing that we're concerned with is the modulation transfer function near the diffraction limit up to at least half Nyquist with the effect of diffraction on MTF following this well-known function. And this equation illustrates why smartphone cameras don't have adjustable iris apertures. A smaller aperture would mean a larger F number, which would mean a smaller diffraction cutoff frequency, which would mean a smaller MTF. For the half Nyquist frequency of 208 line pairs per millimeter commonly used in smartphone camera sensors, you can see how MTF would be rapidly degraded by an adjustable iris. Mathematically, the MTF that defines the best image quality is a product of these several resolution limiting effects, diffraction, aberration, wavefront error, and the sensor. Too small of a spot size will produce images with these false details, called aliasing, which may appear as an unreal sharpening of the small features occurring within these larger moiré patterns. The effect can be filtered out with an optical low-pass filter, or rather a passive anti-aliasing filter, but the spot widening result of diffraction and aberration provides natural filtering, which is why smartphones don't need anti-aliasing filter elements in the lens. When inspecting the designs in the patent, there needs to be some established guideline on minimum acceptable MTF. What should the MTF be? It should be as close to the diffraction limit as possible. More quantitatively, a realistic example was included in Sassian's textbook, 
And I'm going to use it here as a proposed specification. The airy diameter is 3.8 microns, as expected given that the designed F number was 2.35. Aberration produces a blur diameter of 2.79 microns, so on axis at least, this design is diffraction limited. But there is aberration, and its wavefront error pulls down the MTF to 0.52, a little less than the 0.6 suggested in Sassian's textbook example. Now I'm going to move on to setting this up in Optic Studio, and I'll take a closer look at these results there. To economically and practically use aspheric surfaces, these miniature lenses need to be made from injection molded plastic. I want to replace the refractive indices and Abe numbers in the patent with real materials, and I put together a very short catalog of materials in Optic Studio. I pulled some of these plastics out of other vendor catalogs, but the most useful entries came from a sample file on the ZMAX knowledge base. L2 and L4 seem to best match EP6000, a polycarbonate from Mitsubishi gas chemical. L1 and L3 best match APL5014C, made by Mitsui Chemical, and L5 and L6 both appear to be K26F, an olefin polymer made by Xeon Chemicals. It's described on the data sheet as optical lens grade high flow for micro lens, very low haze and low birefringence for mobile device camera lens. So this material is meant exactly for this application. And finally, the glass IR filter is, well, our old crown glass friend NBK7. So let's put this first embodiment into ZMAX Optics Studio. The example embodiment has an effective focal length of 3.33 millimeters, a F number of 2.35, and a half field of view of 39.4 degrees. So set the image space F number to 2.35, and then give it three field points ranging up to 39.4 degrees, with the in-between field being at 70%. Put in the radii of curvatures and the thicknesses of each surface from the first embodiment. And then enter in the material properties that are described, the indices of refraction and the Abe numbers. The last material is NBK7, so instead of the index of refraction, I'll just type in NBK7 and Optic Studio will know what it is. And you end up with something that looks like this, which isn't right yet because the aspheric coefficients haven't been put in. So convert all the surface types to even a sphere. I'll put in all of these conic constants and even order a spheres. I'll type just as fast as I can. I've had a lot of practice. As you can see, no mistakes, and that's what you get. It looks like this. Oh, it doesn't quite look right. Look up at the red field. I think I need to find some mistakes. Uh, there was one on the conic constants. And I'm going to look around for other mistakes. Check out all of the even a spheres, and that's the final result with mistakes removed. The nice thing about this patent is that the example embodiments are good. Look at the spot sizes. It comes with good spots, small, well-focused at the outer fields. The ray fans show only higher order aberrations remaining. And the MTF, I need to change the range of MTFs. The MTF up to about 300 line pairs per millimeter is fairly good, except out at the outer transverse field. Let's look at the MTF versus field. You have to change the frequencies to those of interest for this problem, which is up to 200 or 300 line pairs per millimeter. The MTFs at these higher spatial frequencies could be better, and I'm going to address that in some of the material coming up. With a deep interest in the field, especially the format size and the pixels, I'm going to change the field from object angle to image height. So now the 39.4 degrees corresponds to a 2.8 millimeter image height. Now change all of the materials to real materials rather than these indices and Abe numbers. I will draw on that catalog that I told you about. And we have the final model. And the spots again. And the MTF again. And the MTF versus field again. The field curvature is kept very small with some lateral color evident in the separation of wavelengths. And the distortion has stayed under 2% in its positive pincushion type.
You can get some clues about which aberration is affecting different parts of the image using the full field aberration plots. While using real image height as the field, you can use the full field aberration plot in Optic Studio to view each Zernike polynomial across the full image field. The icon sizes correspond to the magnitude and in some cases the directions of the aberration centered around the chief ray at the selected field. The average value is printed in the information block below. I'm showing the 1.8 millimeter field height and the 2.8 millimeter field height. As you can see, there's no change in the average Zernikes associated with spherical aberration. There's about a 60% increase in the Zernikes associated with coma. Naturally, at the on-axis field number 1, there is no coma, and the average there is 0. And there's a 550% increase in the Zernikes associated with astigmatism going from field 4 to field 7, again with zero astigmatism at field 1. Besides some evident chromatic aberration at the outer field ray fans, astigmatism drives the deviation of the image plane ray piercings the telephoto ratio given by the total track length divided by the effective focal length is about one and a half, so it's not quite telephoto. I'll demonstrate the telephoto ratio in this exact lens system using the drawing tool in Optic Studio's layout viewer. The effective focal length needs to be illustrated, and you do that by drawing a line from the image point on the image surface, extrapolating it out along the direction that the marginal ray makes at the image surface, and then extrapolate the marginal ray that's coming in, and where they intersect is the principal plane. The effective focal length is the distance between the image surface and the principal point. The total track length also needs to be identified, and that's the distance from the front surface vertex to the image plane. And the ratio of the total track length to the effective focal length is the telephoto ratio. Taking a bird's eye view of the system, the total track length is visible from the vertex to the image plane and the effective focal length from the principal point to the image plane. To be telephoto, the effective focal length needs to be longer than the total track length, meaning that the back principal plane needs to be in front of the first vertex surface. By making the front group of three elements collectively positive and the back group of three elements collectively negative, as shown in this paraxial equivalent model of the lens, the telephoto condition can, in principle, be met. But the real thicknesses and spacings of the elements extend the track length of the actual lens beyond its effective focal length. It should be expected with a design like this that there will be a lot of sensitivity to the element thickness in the final image quality. One way this can be controlled is by having an adjustability, and there is in these smartphones. Usually there's a focus adjust, which is accomplished by moving the entire group of lenses relative to the sensor. Voice coil motor actuators are used to affect that motion. So we'll build up a tolerance data editor with compensation in place. In the ZMAX Optic Studio tolerance data editor, there are these different grades. And we're used to seeing commercial precision and high precision. But now there's cell phone lens grade. And I'm going to go ahead and choose the presets that go with that. Now I'll turn on focus compensation. I have tolerance data editor is now set up. So I'm done with the tolerance run, including 1000 Monte Carlo steps. And you'll see that with the compensator in place, there are no thickness worst offenders. And there's an expectation that 98% of the units will have a spot size criterion less than 0 0.01, where the nominal baseline was 0 0.00392. What effect does the worst case Monte Carlo run have on the image quality? This is a point spread function for the baseline, where all of the manufacturer values are just as designed. Zero in is no large point spread, but if we go to the worst case and zoom in on it, now you can see that there is a broader point spread function. The worst case Monte Carlo does add aberration to the image. I would like to see some better performance, so I'm going to run some optimization on the first embodiment from the patent. I'll do an RMS spot size default merit function because a small spot is the best performance, but we need good modulation transfer function too, so I'll show you how I handle that. I should probably have more refined integration on the pupil, but I'm going with this for now. 
And here's my default merit function. It's a spot size merit function. And I added several operands for contrast. So this is MTF, sagittal, and tangential at several different fields. So I had defined a lot of fields in image height. The reason why is because if you don't have a high field density during optimization, you'll end up with contrast at the in-between fields that's poor. I'm only using the aspheric coefficients and the conic constants as variables in the optimization, so there's no fundamental change in the basic design form of the lens. And here's the MTF that I end up with at half Nyquist. Everything's above 10% at the far field, and at the other fields it's much higher. The MTF versus field makes it a little easier to see. Only at the farthest field, at the edge of the image, does the MTF start to roll off. And spot sizes have improved upon where they started. But I'd also like to know how the pixelation on the detector affects the MTF, because this is optical MTF alone. So remember, the effect of the pixels is to include that factor of the sync function associated with the pixel size. I'll use a ZPL macro to calculate the total MTF accounting for the detector. A little bit of user input in these first few lines, and then declare some things. The meat of the macro is in this for loop. The detector MTF is calculated with this sync function. Get MTF grabs the MTF data for the lens system, and then the product is taken and is plotted. So let's take a look at that. Execute it. The pixels are 1.2 microns wide. Look at field 7. The top two lines are the sagittal, where the dashed curve is the optical system only, and the red solid curve is the optical system with the detector, and the bottom curves are the tangential, where again the, the dotted curve is the optical system alone, and then this blue dashed curve is the effect of the optical system on the MTF. So very little effect. It seems fair to say that this system is optically limited, not detector limited. Let's take a look at the first field. In the on-axis field, the tangential and sagittal MTFs are identical. The top curve is the tangential and sagittal MTF of the optical system, and the bottom curve is the influence that the detector has on the MTF. So for on-axis, we may be optically limited, but it's not that strongly optically limited. That is, the detector has a noticeable effect. It brings a half Nyquist MTF from 58 down to about 53. The strategy of using an RMS spot size default merit function along with a lot of contrast operands seems to have paid off. The MTF from the published patent prescription is good, and now it's better, at most fields, without any compromise to the spot size. Any attempt to improve the MTF at full field does result in larger spots, so it was definitely helpful to find some guidance on what is good MTF. You can see evidence of the lack of telecentricity on inspection of the relative illumination across the image field. This results in shading in the outer portions of this image simulated using this lens, along with a 12 megapixel focal plane array. You might notice that the farthest field in the design was at an image height of 2.8 millimeters, but this image goes out to 3 millimeters. That isn't surprising. There's no vignetting, so the illumination continues well beyond the limiting field used in design. Not having any adjustment in the F number makes it more straightforward to correct for the relative illumination after the optics. If you happen to know how relative illumination is corrected in the sensor or the software, please share some of what you know in the comments. I hope that watching this video was as useful for you as making it was for me. Thanks for sticking it out to the end with me.